An Aeolian Harp by Michael Field Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist Dost thou not hear? Amid dun, lonely hills, far off, a melancholy music shrills, as for a joy that no fruition fills. Who live in that far country of the wind? The unclaimed hopes, the powers but half divined, the shy, heroic passions of mankind. And all are young in those reverberant bands. None marshals them, no mellow voice commands. They whirl and eddy as the shifting sands. There, there is the ruin, and no ivy clings. There pass the mourners for untimely things. There breaks the stricken cry of crownless kings. But ever and anon there spreads a boom of wonder through the air, a raining doom with ineffectual plaint as from a tomb. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. After Death by Christina Rossetti. Read for LibriVox.org by Ian King. The curtains were half drawn, the floor was swept and strewn with rushes. Rosemary and may lay thick upon the bed on which I lay, where through the lattice ivy shadows crept. He leaned above me, thinking that I slept and could not hear him. But I heard him say, Poor child, poor child. And as he turned away came a deep silence, and I knew he wept. He did not touch the shroud, or raise the fold that hid my face, or take my hand in his, or ruffle the smooth pillows from my head. He did not love me living, but once dead he pitied me. And very sweet it is to know he still is warm, though I am cold. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. All at Sea The Voyage of a Certain Uncertain Sailor Man by Frederick Moxon. Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. I saw a certain sailor man who sat beside the sea, and in the manner of his tribe. He yawned this yarn to me. "'Twere back in 1853, or maybe 54, I skipped the farm, no, t'were the shop, and went to Baltimore. I shipped aboard the Lizzie, or she might have been the Jane. Them women names are mixy, so I don't remember plain. But anyhow, she were a craft that carried schooner rig although Sam Swab, the bosun, all us swore she were a brig. We sailed away from Salem Town. No, let me think. T'were Lynn, and steered a course for Africa. Or Greece it might have been. But anyway, we tacked and backed and weathered many a storm. Oh, no, as I recall it now, that week was fine and warm. Who did I say the cap'n was? I didn't say at all. Well, now his name were Elijah Bell. Or was it Eli Ball? I kinder guessed were Eli. He'd a big red bushy beard. No, come to think, he always kept his whiskers nicely sheared. But anyhow, that voyage was the first I'd ever took and all I had to do was cut up cabbage for the cook. But come to talk a cabbage just reminds me that their trip would probably be my third one on a Hong Kong clipper ship. The crew, they were a jolly lot, and used to sing a vast, I think it were, 
or else ahoy while bailing out the mast. And as I recollect it now, but here I cut him short, and said, It's time to tack again and bring your wits to port. I came to get a story both adventurous and true, and here is how I started out to write the interview. I saw a certain sailor man. But you turn out to be the most uncertain sailor man that ever sailed the sea. He puffed his pipe and answered, Well, I thought were mine, but still, I must have told the one belongs to my twin brother Bill. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Amor Vitae by Archibald Lampman, read for LibriVox.org by Rickard from Sweden. I love the warm bare earth and all that works and dreams thereon. I love the seasons yet to fall. I love the ages gone. The valleys with the sheeted grain, the river's smiling might, the merry wind, the rustling rain, the vastness of the night. I love the morning's flames, the steep, where down the vapor clings. I love the clouds that float and sleep, and every bird that sings. I love the purple shower that pours on far-off fields at even. I love the pine-wood dusk whose floors are like the courts of heaven. I love the heaven's azure span, the grass beneath my feet. I love the face of every man whose thought is swift and sweet. I let the wrangling world go by, and like an idle breath, its echoes and its phantoms fly, I care no jot for death. Time like a titan, bright and strong, spreads one enchanted gleam, each hour is but a fluted song, and life a lofty dream. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. At Night by Amy Lowell Read for LibriVox.org By Shakira July 2015 The wind is singing through the trees tonight A deep-voiced song of rushing cadences And crashing intervals No summer breeze is this Though hot July is at its height Gone is her gentler music. With delight she listens to this booming like the seas, these elemental loud necessities which call to her to answer their swift might. Above the tossing trees shines down a star, quietly bright. This wild tumultuous joy quickens nor dims its splendour. And my mind, O oh star, is filled with your white light from far. So suffer me this one night to enjoy the freedom of the onward sweeping wind. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Cornelius Agrippa his epitaph by unknown read for LibriVox.org. why weepest thou marble is thy trust too great for such a sacred dust or dost thou make thy pious moan that we might turn our hearts from stone as converts then we'll weep with you our hearts shall melt to marble too for there's penned up within thy pit a world composed of worth and wit. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Coming Home by Augusta Webster. Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist. Five minutes here and they must steal two more. Shameful. Here have I been five mortal years, and not seen home nor one dear kindred face, and these abominable slugs, this guard, this driver, porters, what are they about? Keep us here motionless two minutes, 
three aha at last good we shall catch our minutes we're flying after them like a mad wind chasing the leaves it has tossed on in front oh glorious wild speed what giants play and there are men who tell us poetry is dead where railways come maybe tis true i'm a bad judge i've had scant reading time and little will to read and certainly i've not found railways in what verse i know but there's a whiz and whirr as trains go by a bullet-like indomitable rush and then all's done which makes me often think one of those men who found out poetry and had to write the things just that they saw would have made some of their fine crashing lines that stir one like the marches one knows best and the enemy knows best with trains in them as easily as chariots anyhow i've poetry and music too to-day in the very clatter it goes home 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 and they'll think that sharp shriek a kinder sound than sweetest singing when it presently pierces the quiet of the night and sends its eager shrillness on for miles before to say i'm no time distant i can see my mother's soft pink cheeks like roses pale after a june week's blooming flush and wan and her lip quiver i can see the girls restless between the hall door and the clock hear it and hush and lean expectant heads to catch the rattle of the coming train my father sitting shawing by the fire at all the fuss and waiting half start up dropping his times forgetful just so long that he is not impatient like the rest the tender foolish women and alert to hide how he was tempted to fuss too reseat himself intent on politics and hugh i think hugh must be there with them on leave out of his parish for a day a truant from the old women and the schools to be at home with me for long enough to say god bless you in i can see hugh narrow and straight in his skimp priestly coat pacing the room with slow and even steps and a most patient face and in his eyes that over-patience we all know in them when he is being extra good and calm so little change they write me all of them with the same faces scarce a day's mark there except our little maud who was a child and is a woman little maud grown tall the little maud i left half prude half romp who eager for her grown-up dignities tried to forego her mischiefs and would turn just in their midst portentously demure like a tired sleepy kitten and to-day wears all her womanhood inside her heart and has none for her manners some of it for her sweet winsome face though and a look that's in her portrait brings my mother back though she's not like they tell me i shall see yes i shall see soon almost now dear home to think i am so near ah when i lay in the hot thirst and fever of my wound and saw their faces pressing into mine changing and changing never a one would stay so long that i could see it like itself i scarcely hoped for this and when i felt that tiring weakness of my growing strong and was so helpless and the babyish tears would come without a thought to make them come i almost knew this day would never be but oh my happy fortune not to die not even to come home among them then with nothing done a spoiled and worthless wreck for them to weep at softly out of sight but to go stoutly to my post again and do my stroke of work as a man should and win them this you little dingy cross less precious than my sleeve links what a worth lies in your worthlessness there's not a man but glider lays you in his mother's hand or wife's and he would bring her for his gift the whole great jewels of an eastern king and not a woman but my mother though sometimes she was not strong have i been rash too thoughtless of her calm not telling of it no i'll not wear it on me as i meant to take her first dear kisses in we'll talk before i show it in a day or two perhaps to-night I know she'll prize it more that a life saved went to the winning it. 
and tender-hearted ellen will forgive my part she shudders at in the red deaths of battlefields a little more for that how sad her letters were i know she thinks we learn a heathenish passion after blood and as she said to throw our lives like dross back in our maker's face but by and by i'll teach her how it is and that we fight for duty not like either fiends or fools they say they are longing for my history told by the fire of evenings all my deeds all my escapes and i must clear their minds of fifty puzzles of the journalists decide what's true and make them understand the battles and the marchings but my deeds have been to just be one among them all doing what we were bidden as we could and my escapes must have been like the rest one has no time to know them just that once when i was dragging off the fallen boy I knew what death was nearest as it missed, but I've no memory of more escapes, except by being wounded as they know, and what can I explain of battle plans made in the councils, whether kept or not, I cannot tell. I only know my part in theirs with whom I waited at our post, or dashed on at the word. I could not mark the swaying of the squadrons, the recoils and shifting ground and sudden strategies, and had no duty to be watching them no i shall make them better out in print and learn in our snug study what i saw among the rush and smoke no i come back no better talker than i was before no readier and no deeper not like hugh and i must use my unaspiring wits to say things as i see them going straight just as a plain man's life does tramping on the way that lies before one with no wise no wise ah how that chance word takes me back to pinafore time my father's well-known phrase no whying boy but do what you are bid and once my mother when first hugh began to be so clever and had found it out and pleased at it perhaps a little pert was apt to hit on puzzles answered him our nursery rule was good for afterwards spared headaches and spared heartaches and well kept made the best heroes and best christians too how i can see hugh looking down to say in an odd slow tone i will remember that and well he has remembered never a man went straighter into action than our hugh he knows what side he's on and stands to it if i'd a head like his and wished to change soldiering for anything i'd try to learn a parish parson's work to do it like hugh will he read prayers to-night i'd like to hear my father at it as it used to be before we any of us went away the old time's back again. Oh, all of us will say our prayers tonight out of glad hearts. Oh, thank God for the meeting we shall have. Such joy among us, and the countryside all to be glad for us. Ah, well, I fear there's one will shrink and sadden at my sight among the welcomes and the happiness, remembering that her husband was my friend and dropped beside me. But I'll go alone or maybe with my mother to her house and let her have the pain more quietly before she sees me in our sunday pew with all the old friends smiling through the prayers and all but nodding and a buzzing round spoiling the parson's reading look and look there's master harry come back from the war oh how my mother's eyes will turn to me half unawares then fix upon her book that none may see them growing large and moist and how my father will look stern and frown, hiding the treacherous twinkles with the shade of knitted brows, lest any watching him should think him moved to have his son by him, and proud like foolish fathers. But the girls will be all smiles and flutter, and look round elate as if no other girls before had had a soldier brother. And old Will, out of his corner by the vestry door, will peer and blink and suck his grins in tight, trying to mind the sermon and not think what sport he has for me in the preserves plenty of birds this year my father writes we'll see next week and there's the long shrill yell home all but home oh there between the trees that light our house they're waiting for me there end of poem this recording is in the public domain the dong with a luminous nose by Edward Lear, read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug.
when awful darkness and silence reign over the great Grombulian plain through the long, long wintry nights, when the angry breakers roar as they beat on the rocky shore, when storm clouds brood on the towering heights of the hills of the Chankli bore. Then, through the vast and gloomy dark, there moves what seems a fiery spark, a lonely spark with silvery rays piercing the coal black night, a meteor strange and bright. Hither and thither the vision strays, a single lurid light. Slowly it wanders, pauses, creeps, anon it sparkles, flashes and leaps, and ever as onward it gleaming goes, a light on the bong tree stems it throws, and those who watch at that midnight hour, from hall or terrace or lofty tower, cry, as the wild light passes along. The dong, the dong, the wandering dong through the forest goes, the dong, the dong, the dong with a luminous nose. Long years ago the dong was happy and gay, till he fell in love with a jumbly girl who came to those shores one day. For the jumblies came in a sieve they did, landing at eve near the zemery fid, where the oblong oysters grow, and the rocks are smooth and grey, and the woods and the valleys rang with the chorus they daily and nightly sang. Far and few, far and few are the lands where the jumblies live, their heads are green, and their hands are blue, and they went to sea in a sieve. Happily, happily passed those days, while the cheerful jumblies stayed, they danced in circlets all night long to the plaintive pipe of the lively dong in moonlight shine or shade for day and night he was always there by the side of the jumbly girl so fair with her sky-blue hands and her sea-green hair till the morning came of that hateful day when the jumblies sailed in their sieve away and the dong was left on the cruel shore gazing gazing for evermore, ever keeping his weary eyes on that pea-green sail on the far horizon, singing the jumbly chorus still as he sat all day on the grassy hill. Far and few, far and few are the lands where the jumblies live, their heads are green and their hands are blue, and they went to sea in a sieve. But when the sun was low in the west, the dong arose and said, What little sense I once possessed has quite gone out of my head. And since that day he wanders still by lake and forest, marsh and hill, singing, Oh, somewhere, in valley or plain, might I find my jumbly girl again. For ever I'll seek by lake and shore till I find my jumbly girl once more playing a pipe with silvery squeaks, since then his jumbly girl he seeks. And because by night he could not see, he gathered the bark of the twangum tree on the flowery plain that grows. And he wove him a wondrous nose, a nose as strange as a nose could be, of vast proportions and painted red, and tied with cords to the back of his head. In a hollow rounded space it ended with a luminous lamp within suspended, or fenced about with a bandage stout to prevent the wind from blowing it out, and with holes all round to send the light in gleaming rays on the dismal night. And now, each night, and all night long, over those plains still roams the dong, and above the wail of the chimp and snipe you may hear the squeak of his plaintive pipe, while ever he seeks, but seeks in vain, to meet with his jumbly girl again. Lonely and wild, all night he goes, the dong with a luminous nose, and all who watch at the midnight hour, from hall or terrace or lofty tower, cry as they trace the meteor bright, moving along through the dreary night. This is the hour when forth he goes, the dong with a luminous nose. Yonder, 
Over the plain he goes, he goes, he goes, the dong with a luminous nose. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Hymn to God My God in My Sickness by John Dunn. Read for LibriVox.org by Ian King. Since I am coming to that holy room, where with thy choir of saints for evermore I shall be made thy music. As I come, I tune the instrument here at the door, and what I must do then, think here before. Whilst my physicians, by their love, are grown cosmographers, and I their map, who lie flat on this bed, that by them may be shown that this is my southwest discovery. Per fratum febris, by these straits to die, I joy that in these straits I see my west. For though their currents yield return to none, what shall my west hurt me, as west and east in all flat maps, and I am one, are one. So death doth touch the resurrection. Is the Pacific Sea my home, or are the eastern riches? Is Jerusalem, Anyan, and Magellan, and Gibraltar, all straits, and none but straits, our ways to them, whether where Japhet dwelt, or Sham, or Sem? We think that Paradise and Calvary, Christ's cross, and Adam's tree stood in one place. Look, Lord, and find both Adams met in me, as the first Adam sweat surrounds my face. May the last Adam's blood my soul embrace. So in his purple wrapped receive me, Lord. By these his thorns give me his other crown. And as to other souls I preached thy word. Be this my text, my sermon to mine own. Therefore that he may raise, the Lord throws down. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. I am the Reaper by William Ernest Henley. Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk. I am the Reaper. All things with heedful hook. Silent I gather. Pale roses. Touched with the spring, tall corn in summer, fruits rich with autumn, and frail winter blossoms, reaping, still reaping, all things with heedful hook, timely I gather. I am the sower, all the unbodied life runs through my seed sheet, atom with atom wed. Each quickening the other, fall through my hands, ever changing, still changeless, ceaselessly sowing. Life, incorruptible life, flows from my seed sheet. Maker and breaker, I am the ebb and the flood, here and hereafter, sped through the tangle and coil of infinite nature. Viewless and soundless I fashion all being. Taker and giver, I am the womb and the grave, the now and the ever. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Is my team ploughing? By A. E. Hausman, read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. Is my team ploughing that I was used to drive, and hear the harness jingle when I was man alive? Ay, the horses trample, the harness jingles now. No change, O oh, you lie under the land you used to plough. 
Is football playing along the river shore, With lads to chase the leather, now I stand up no more? Ay, the ball is flying, the lads play heart and soul. The goal stands up, the keeper stands up to keep the goal. Is my girl happy that I thought hard to leave, And has she tired of weeping as she lies down at eve? Ay, she lies down lightly, she lies not down to weep. Your girl is well contented. Be still, my lad, and sleep. Is my friend hearty, now I am thin and pine? And has he found to sleep in a better bed than mine? Yes, lad, I lie easy. I lie as lads would choose. I cheer a dead man's sweetheart. Never ask me whose. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. July Midnight by Amy Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Shakira July 2015 Fireflies flicker in the tops of trees, Flicker in the lower branches, Skim along the ground. Over the moon-white lilies Is a flashing and ceasing Of small lemon-green stars. As you lean against me, moon-white, The air all about you Is slit and pricked And pointed with sparkles Of lemon-green flame, Starting out of a background Of vague blue trees. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. London Snow by Robert Bridges Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug Perth, Western Australia When men were all asleep, the snow came flying In large white flakes falling on the city brown stealthily and perpetually settling and loosely lying hushing the latest traffic of the drowsy town deadening muffling stifling its murmurs failing lazily and incessantly floating down and down silently sifting and veiling road roof and railing hiding difference making unevenness even into angles and crevices softly drifting and sailing. At night it fell, and when full inches seven it lay in the depth of its uncompacted lightness, the clouds blew off from a high and frosty heaven, and all woke earlier for the unaccustomed brightness of the winter dawning, the strange unheavenly glare. The eye marvelled, marvelled at the dazzling whiteness, the ear hearkened to the stillness of the solemn air. No sound of wheel rumbling, nor of foot falling, and the busy morning cries came thin and spare. Then boys I heard, as they went to school, calling. They gathered up the crystal manna to freeze their tongues with tasting, their hands with snowballing, or rioted in a drift, plunging up to the knees, or peering up from under the white mossed wonder. Oh, look at the trees, they cried, oh, look at the trees. With lessened load, a few carts creak and blunder, following along the white, deserted way, a country company long dispersed asunder. When now already the sun, in pale display, standing by Paul's high dome, spread forth below his sparkling beams, and awoke the stir of the day. For now doors open, and war is waged with the snow, and trains of sombre men, past tale of number, tread long brown paths, as toward their toil they go. But even for them a while no cares encumber, their minds diverted. The daily word is unspoken, 
The daily thoughts of labour and sorrow slumber at the sight of the beauty that greets them, for the charm they have broken. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Love and Life by John Wilmot, Earl of Rochester. Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp. All my past life is mine no more. The flying hours are gone like transitory dreams given o'er, whose images are kept in store by memory alone. The time that is to come is not. How can it then be mine? The present moment's all my lot, and that, as fast as it is got, Phyllis is only thine. Then talk not of inconstancy, false hearts, and broken vows. If I by miracle can be this live long minute true to thee, tis all that heaven allows. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Lover by Amy Lowell Read for LibriVox.org By Shakira July 2015 If I could catch the green lantern of the firefly, I could see to write you a letter. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Love's Philosophy by Percy Bysshe Shelley Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp The fountains mingle with a river and the rivers with the ocean. The winds of heaven mix forever with a sweet emotion. Nothing in the world is single. All things by a law divine in one spirit meet and mingle. Why not I with thine? See the mountains kiss high heaven, and the waves clasp one another. No sister flower would be forgiven if it disdained its brother. And the sunlight clasps the earth, and the moonbeams kiss the sea. What is all this sweet work worth, if thou kiss not me? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Midnight by Archibald Lampman Read for LibriVox.org by Richard from Sweden from where I sit I see the stars and down the chilly floor, The moon between the frozen bars is glimmering dim and hoar. Without in many a peaked mound the glinting snowdrifts lie, There is no voice or living sound, the embers slowly die. Yet some wild thing is in mine ear, I hold my breath and hark, Out of the depth I seem to hear a crying in the dark. No sound of man or wife or child, no sound of beast that groans, Or of the wind that whistles wild, or of the tree that moans. I know not what it is I hear, I bend my head and hark, I cannot drive it from mine ear, that crying in the dark. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Night on the Prairies by Walt Whitman Read for LibriVox.org by Ian King Night on the prairies, the supper is over, The fire on the ground burns low, The wearied emigrants sleep, wrapped in their blankets. I walk by myself, I stand and look at the stars, Which I think now I never realised before. Now I absorb immortality and peace, I admire death, and test propositions. How plenteous, how spiritual, how resume. The same old man and soul, the same old aspirations, and the same content. I was thinking the day most splendid, till I saw what the not-day exhibited. I was thinking 
this globe enough, till there sprang out, so noiseless around me, myriads of other globes. Now, while the great thoughts of space and eternity fill me, I will measure myself by them. And now, touched with the lives of other globes, arrived as far along as those of the earth, or waiting to arrive, or passed on farther than those of the earth, I henceforth no more ignore them than I ignore my own life, or the lives of the earth arrived as far as mine, or waiting to arrive. Oh, I see now that life cannot exhibit all to me, as the day cannot. I see that I am to wait for what will be exhibited by death. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. O oh, Gather Me the Rose by William Ernest Henley Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk O oh, Gather Me the Rose, the Rose, while yet in flower we find it. For summer smiles, but summer goes, and winter waits behind it. For with the dream foregone, foregone, the deed forborn forever. The worm, regret, will canker on, And time will turn him never. So well it were to love, my love, And cheat of any laughter, The fate beneath us and above, The dark before and after. The myrtle and the rose, the rose, The sunshine and the swallow, The dream that comes, the wish, that goes the memories that follow end of poem this recording is in the public domain outgrown by julia caroline dor read for librivox.org by danny hogger nay you wrong her my friend she's not fickle her love has simply outgrown. One can read the whole matter, translating her heart by the light of one's own. Can you bear me to talk with you frankly? There is so much that my heart would say. And you know we were children together, have quarreled and made up in play. And so, for the sake of old friendship, I venture to tell you the truth, as plainly perhaps and as bluntly as I might in our earlier youth. Five years ago, when you wooed her, you stood on the self-same plane, face to face, heart to heart, never dreaming your souls could be parted again. She loved you at that time entirely, in the bloom of her life's early May, and it is not her fault, I repeat it, and she does not love you today. Nature never stands still, nor souls either. They ever go up or go down, and hers has been steadily soaring, but how has it been with your own? She has struggled and yearned and aspired, grown stronger and wiser each year. The stars are not farther above you in yon luminous atmosphere. For she whom you crowned with fresh roses down yonder five summers ago has learned that the first of our duties to God and ourselves is to grow. Her eyes, they are sweeter and calmer, but their vision is clearer as well. Her voice has a tenderer cadence, but it rings like a silver bell. Her face has the look worn by those who with God and his angels have talked. The white robes she wears are less white than the spirits with whom she has walked. And you? Have you aimed at the highest? Have you too aspired and prayed? Have you looked upon evil unsullied? Have you conquered it undismayed? Have you, too, grown stronger and wiser as the months and years have rolled on? Did you meet her this morning rejoicing in the triumph of victory won? Nay, hear me, the truth cannot harm you. When today in her presence you stood, was the hand that you gave her as white and clean as that of her womanhood? Go measure yourself by her standard. Look back on the years that have fled. Then ask, if you need, why she tells you that the love of her girlhood is dead. 
She cannot look down to her lover. Her love, like her soul, aspires. He must stand by her side or above her, who would kindle its holy fires. Now, farewell. For the sake of old friendship, I have ventured to tell you the truth, as plainly, perhaps, and as bluntly, as I might in our earlier youth. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Over the Wall by Julia Caroline Dorr Read for LibriVox.org by Danny Hogger I know a spot where the wild vines creep And the coral moss cups grow And where, at the foot of the rocky steep, The sweet blue violets blow. There, all day long, in the summertime, you may hear the river's dreamy rhyme. There, all day long, does the honey bee murmur and hum in the hollow tree. And there, the feathery hemlock makes a shadow cool and sweet, while from its emerald wing it shakes rare incense at your feet. There do the silvery lichens cling. There does the tremulous harebell swing. And many a scarlet berry shines deep in the green of the tangled vines. Over the wall at dawn of day, over the wall at noon, over the wall when the shadows say that night is coming soon. A little maiden with laughing eyes climbs in her eager haste and hies down to the spot where the wild vines creep and violets bloom by the rocky steep. All wild things love her. The murmuring bee scarce stirs when she draws near, and sings the bird in the hemlock tree, its sweetest for her ear. The harebells nod as she passes by. The violet lifts its tender eye. The low ferns bend her steps to greet, and the mosses creep to her dancing feet. Up in her pathway seems to spring all that is sweet or rare chrysalis quaint or the moth's bright wing or flower buds strangely fair she watches the tiniest bird's nest hid the thickly clustering leaves amid and the small brown tree toed on her arm quietly hops and fears no harm ah the child of the laughing eyes and heart attuned to nature's voice thou hast found a bliss that will ne'er depart while earth can say rejoice the years must come and the years must go but the flowers will bloom and the breezes blow and bird and butterfly moth and bee bring on their swift wings joy to thee end of poem this recording is in the public domain on the painting of the sistine chapel by michelangelo buonarotti Translated by John Addington Simons Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug I've grown a goitre by dwelling in this den As cats from stagnant streams in Lombardy Or in what other land they hap to be Which drives the belly close beneath the chin My beard turns up to heaven My nape falls in, fixed on my spine my breastbone visibly grows like a harp. A rich embroidery bedews my face from brush strips, thick and thin. My loins into my paunch like levers grind. My buttock like a crupper bears my weight. My feet unguided wander to and fro. In front my skin grows loose and long. Behind, by bending, it becomes more taut and straight. Crosswise I strain me like a Syrian bow, Whence false and quaint, I know, Must be the fruit of squinting brain and eye, For ill can aim the gun that bends awry. Come then, Giovanni, try to succour my dead pictures and my fame, Since foul I fare, and painting is my shame. End of poem this recording is in the public domain. Paul's Wife by Robert Frost Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp 
To drive Paul out of any lumber camp, all that was needed was to say to him, How is the wife, Paul? And he'd disappear. Some said it was because he had no wife and hated to be twitted on the subject. Others, because he'd come within a day or so of having one and then been jilted. Others, because he had had one once, a good one, who'd run away with someone else and left him. And others still, because he had one now, he only had to be reminded of. He was all duty to her in a minute. He had to run right off to look her up, as if to say, That's so, how is my wife? I hope she isn't getting into mischief. No one was anxious to get rid of Paul. He'd been the hero of the mountain camps ever since, just to show them, he had slipped the bark of a whole tamarack off whole, as clean as boys do off a willow twig to make a willow whistle on a Sunday in April by subsiding meadow brooks. They seemed to ask him just to see him go. How is the wife, Paul? And he always went. He never stopped to murder anyone who asked the question. He just disappeared. Nobody knew in what direction. Although it wasn't usually long before they heard of him in some new camp, the same Paul at the same old feats of logging. The question everywhere was, why should Paul object to being asked a civil question? A man you could say almost anything to, short of a fighting word. You have the answers. And there was one more not so fair to Paul, that Paul had married a wife not his equal. Paul was ashamed of her. To match a hero, she would have had to been a heroine, instead of which she was some half-breed squaw. But if the story Murphy told was true, she wasn't anyone to be ashamed of. You know, Paul could do wonders. Everyone's heard how he thrashed the horses on a load that wouldn't budge until they simply stretched their rawhide harness from the load to camp. Paul told the boss the load would be all right. The sun will bring your load in. And it did. By shrinking the rawhide to natural length, that's what's called a stretcher. But I guess the one about his jumping so's to land with both his feet at once against the ceiling, and then land safely right side up again, back on the floor, is fact, or pretty near fact. Well, this is such a yarn. Paul sawed his wife out of a white pine log. Murphy was there, and, as you might say, saw the lady born. Paul worked at anything in lumbering. He'd been hard at it, taking boards away for, I forget, the last ambitious sawyer to want to find out if he couldn't pile the lumber on Paul till Paul begged for mercy. They'd sliced the first slab off a big butt log, and the sawyer had slammed the carriage back to slam end on again against the saw teeth. To judge them by the way they caught themselves when they saw what had happened to the log, they must have had a guilty expectation something was going to go with their slam banging. Something had left a long black streak of grease on the new wood the whole length of the log, except perhaps a foot at either end. But when Paul put his finger in the grease, it wasn't grease at all, but a long slot. The log was hollow. They were sawing pine. First time I ever saw a hollow pine. That comes of having Paul around the place. Take it to hell for me, the sawyer said. Everyone had to have a look at it and tell Paul what he ought to do about it. They treated it as his. You take a jackknife and spread the opening, and you've got a dugout all dug to go a-fishing in. To Paul, the hollow looked too sound and clean and empty ever to have housed birds or beasts or bees. There was no entrance for them to get in by. It looked to him like some new kind of hollow he thought he'd better take his jackknife to. So after work that evening he came back and let enough light into it by cutting to see if it was empty. He made out in there a slender length of pith. Or was it pith? It might have been the skin a snake had cast and left stood up on end inside the tree the hundred years the tree must have been growing. More cutting, and he had this in both hands, and looking from it, to the pond nearby, Paul wondered how it would respond to water. Not a breeze stirred, but just the breath of air he made in walking slowly to the beach blew it once off his hands and almost broke it. He laid it at the edge where it could drink. At the first drink it rustled and grew limp. At the next drink it grew invisible. Paul dragged the shallows for it with his fingers and thought it must have melted. It was gone. 
and then, beyond the open water, dim with midges, where the log drive lay pressed against the boom, it slowly rose a person, rose a girl, her wet hair heavy on her like a helmet, who, leaning on a log, looked back at Paul, and that made Paul, in turn, look back to see if there was anyone behind him that she was looking at instead of him. Murphy had been there watching all the time, but from a shed where neither of them could see him. There was a moment of suspense in birth, when the girl seemed too waterlogged to live, before she caught her first breath with a gasp and laughed. Then she climbed slowly to her feet and walked off, talking to herself or Paul, across the logs like backs of alligators, Paul taking after her around the pond. Next evening, Murphy and some other fellows got drunk and tracked the pair up Catamount, from the bare top of which there is a view to other hills across a Kettle Valley. And there, well after dark, let Murphy tell it. They saw Paul and his creature keeping house. It was the only glimpse that anyone has had of Paul and her since Murphy saw them falling in love across the twilight mill pond. More than a mile across the wilderness, they sat together halfway up a cliff and a small niche led into it. The girl brightly, as if a star played on the place, Paul darkly, like her shadow. All the light was from the girl herself, though not a star, as was apparent from what happened next. All those great ruffians put their throats together and let out a loud yell and threw a bottle as a brute tribute of respect to beauty. Of course, the bottle fell short by a mile, but the shout reached the girl and put her light out. She went out like a firefly, and that was all. So there were witnesses that Paul was married, and not to anyone to be ashamed of. Everyone had been wrong in judging Paul. Murphy told me Paul put on all those airs about his wife to keep her to himself. Paul was what's called a terrible possessor. Owning a wife with him meant owning her. She wasn't anybody else's business, either to praise her or to so much as name her, and he'd thank people not to think of her. Murphy's idea was that a man like Paul wouldn't be spoken to about a wife in any way the world knew how to speak in. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Riders in the Stand by A. B. Banjo Patterson Read for LibriVox.org by Son of the Exiles The Riders in the Stand There's some that ride the Robbo style and bump at every stride, while others sit a long way back to get a longer ride. There's some that ride like sailors do, with legs and arms and teeth, and some ride on the horse's neck, and some ride underneath. But all the finest horsemen out, the men to beat the band, you'll find amongst the crowd that ride their races in the stand. They'll say he had the race in hand, and lost it in the straight. They'll show how Godby came too soon, and Barden came too late. They'll say Chevalier lost his nerve, and Regan lost his head. They'll tell how one was livened up, and something else was dead. In fact, the race was never run on sea or sky or land, but what you'd get it better done by riders in the stand. The rule holds good in everything in life's uncertain fight. You'll find the winner can't go wrong, the loser can't go right. You ride a slashing race and lose by one and all your band. Ride like a bag of flour and win. They'll cheer you in the stand. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Two Loves by Lord Alfred Douglas Read for LibriVox.org by David Bushhouse of New Kent, Virginia I dreamed I stood upon a little hill, And at my feet there lay a ground That seemed like a waste garden flowering at its will with buds and blossoms. There were pools that dreamed black and unruffled. There were white lilies a few, 
and crocuses, and violets purple or pale, snake-like fritillaries scarce seen for the rank grass, and through green nets blue eyes of shy perianche winked in the sun, and there were curious flowers before unknown, flowers that were stained with moonlight, or with shades of nature's willful moods, and here a one that had drunk in a transitory tone of one brief moment in a sunset, blades of grass that in an hundred springs had been slowly but exquisitely nurtured by the stars, and watered by the scented dew long cupped in lilies, that for rays of sun had seen only God's glory, for never a sunrise mars the luminous air of heaven. Beyond abrupt, a grey stone wall, or grown with velvet moss uprose, and gazing I stood long, all mazed to see a place so strange, so sweet, so fair. And as I stood and marveled, lo, across the garden came a youth. One hand he raised to shield him from the sun. His wind-tossed hair was twined with flowers, and in his hand he bore a purple bunch of bursting grapes. His eyes were clear as crystal, naked all was he, white as the snow on pathless mountain's floor. Red were his lips as red wine spilleth that dyes a marble floor, his brow chalcedony, and he came near me with his lips uncurled and kind, and caught my hand and kissed my mouth, and gave me grapes to eat, and said, Sweet friend, come, I will show thee shadows of the world and images of life. See, from the south comes the pale pageant that hath never an end. And lo, within the garden of my dream I saw two walking on a shining plain of golden light. The one did joyous seem, and fair and blooming, and a sweet refrain came from his lips. He sang of pretty maids and joyous love of comely girl and boy. His eyes were bright, and amid the dancing blades of golden grass his feet did trip for joy. And in his hand he held an ivory lute with strings of gold that were as maiden's hair, and sang with voice as tuneful as a flute. And round his neck three chains of roses were. But he that was his comrade walked aside. He was full sad and sweet, and his large eyes were strange with wondrous brightness staring wide with gazing, and he sighed with many sighs that moved me, and his cheeks were wan and white like pallid lilies, and his lips were red like poppies, and his hands he clenched tight, and yet again unclenched, and his head was wreathed with moonflowers pale as lips of death. A purple robe he wore, or wrought with gold, with the device of a great snake, whose breath was fiery flame, which when I did behold, I fell a-weeping, and I cried, Sweet youth, tell me why, sad and sighing, thou dost rove these pleasant realms. I pray thee, speak me sooth. What is thy name? He said, My name is Love. Then straight the first did turn himself to me, and cried, He lieth, for his name is Shame, but I am Love, and I was wont to be alone in this fair garden, till he came unasked by night. I am true Love. I fill the hearts of boy and girl with mutual flame. Then sighing, said the other, Have thy will. I am the love that dare not speak its name. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Unlovely by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Sarah Soleri the pretty things that others wear look strange and out of place on me. I never seem dressed tastefully because I am not fair. And when I would most pleasing seem and deck myself with joyful care, I find it is an idle dream because I am not fair. If I put roses in my hair, they bloom as if in mockery. Nature denies her sympathy because I am not fair. Alas, I have a warm, true heart, but when I show it, people stare. I must forever dwell apart, because I am not fair. I am least happy being where 
the hearts of others are most light, and strive to keep me out of sight because I am not fair. The glad ones often give a glance as I am sitting lonely there, that ask me why I do not dance, because I am not fair. And if to smile on them I dare, for that my heart with love runs o'er, they say, what is she laughing for? Because I am not fair. Love scorned or misinterpreted, it is the hardest thing to bear. I often wish that I were dead, because I am not fair. In joy or grief I must not share, for neither smiles nor tears on me will ever look becomingly, because I am not fair. Whole days I sit alone and cry, and in my grave I wish I were, Yet none will weep me if I die, because I am not fair. My grave will be so lone and bare, I fear to think of those dark hours, for none will plant it o'er with flowers, because I am not fair. They will not in the summer come and speak kind words above me there. To me the grave will be no home, because I am not fair. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Verses by Lawrence Hope. Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist. You are my God, and I would fain adore you with sweet and secret rites of other days. Burn scented oil and silver lamps before you, Pour perfume on your feet with prayer and praise. Yet are we one, your gracious condescension granted, And grants, the loveliness I crave. One, in the perfect sense of eastern mention, Gold and the bracelet, water and the wave. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Where Forlorn Sunsets Flare and Fade by William Ernest Henley Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk Where forlorn sunsets flare and fade On desolate sea and lonely sand Out of the silence and the shade What is the voice of strange command Calling you still as friend calls friend with love that cannot brook delay to rise and follow the ways that wend over the hills and far away hark in the city street on street a roaring reach of death and life of vortices that clash and fleet and ruin in a pointed strife hark to it calling calling clear calling until you cannot stay from dearer things than your own most dear over the hills and far away out of the sound of the ebb and flow out of the sight of lamp and star it calls you where the good winds blow and the unchanging meadows are from faded hopes and hopes agleam it calls you calls you night and day beyond the dark into the dream over the hills and far away end of poem this recording is in the public domain you remain by Arthur Simons, read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. As a perfume doth remain in the folds where it hath lain, so the thought of you remaining deeply folded in my brain will not leave me. 
all things leave me you remain other thoughts may come and go other moments i may know that shall waft me in their going as a breath blown to and fro fragrant memories fragrant memories come and go only thoughts of you remain in my heart where they have lain perfumed thoughts of you remaining a hid sweetness in my brain others leave me all things leave me you remain and a poem this recording is in the public domain